It is uh, uh, Australian customs. Uh, I, for the last 45 years, have, have lived and worked in and around Indigenous communities. Uh, I've been adopted into a family, and when one um, family goes into another uh, territory, it is always right that we pay respect. So it is with that I say I want to pay my respect uh, to the uh, true owners of this land, to the Sioux Indians, and I'd like to acknowledge their traditional chiefs, past, present, and future, and to thank them for allowing me to be here on this land with you today. With that, um, Gwen gave me a list of topics to talk to, and uh, I'm one of those blacks who never, uh, I don't really have PowerPoint presentations prepared. And so yesterday, I spent all day and into the night looking for pictures to try to match up with the things that uh, Gwen's asked me to speak to today. Now, usually, my greatest critic, my wife, who uh, is just heavily into me about formatting, uh, you know, that can't be a capital, this has got to be lowercase, uh, no, that doesn't make sense, isn't with me. <laughs> so, so, please, you know, as you see uh, one title with all caps and the next one without, or one, you know, that's my fault, not, you know, she would be appalled if she seen that. It's your style. It's my style, yes, right. Okay, so today, uh, uh, just a little bit about myself. I, uh, people ask me, yes, I studied architecture, but I don't really call myself an architect so much. In, and I say to young students, I really have no idea uh, what I am, because uh, I do so many different things. So I remember uh, being a young man, about 22 years old, Studying it, sitting in this uh, design studio, there was, I don't know, two or three hundred of us. And uh, this really old professor, he must have been at least 40. <laughs> and and he, he had a set of braces and a bow tie. And he said, uh, gentlemen, because there was no females there, gentlemen, in your lifetime, uh, you will have four different occupations. And I thought... What a silly old man. What does he know? Well, as you know, it's all come true. And today, as you also realize, especially with millennials, as soon as they get a job, they're on the search for the next job. So how many occupations, how many jobs are they going to have in a lifetime? No one knows. So, uh, as I say, I've probably been in about 100 countries. I spent 10 years working in Africa. I've been in 20 African countries. Suff suffered some consequences of being there as well. I've written building codes. I've d probably uh, designed and helped build about 30,000 homes around Africa. My first project was 5,000 homes in South Africa when apartheid finished. So, um, Let's, let's get started. Anyway, I think that's enough about me. I could probably talk all day about myself. We, we didn't come here to hear about me. Wrong button. What am I doing? Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about, here's what we're looking at today. We're looking at, uh, at Ralph Patty. Henry DeLong, probably more Ralph Petty. Um, we're also looking at, at Ramed Earth Construction, how we do it, how we build it, what it is, uh, and what's the, a little bit of difference between that and other types of earth building. Now, there are probably about 10 different types of earth wall construction. I'm not covering those today. I'm just looking at the three basic three ones that mostly used in the world. And then I'm looking a little bit about the, a little into the scientific area of rammed earth building as well, which was introduced to me by Ralph Patty. Now, I think also I should mention, you know, Ralph Patty. 
Um, quickly, I want to say that in 1990, I was visiting South Africa and with a friend of mine by the name of Professor Rodney Harbour from University of Natal in Durban. This is before apartheid was finished, but it was coming closer to the end. And I was looking at his house. His house was built with packing crates, wind screens. This is a long story, but I won't, I'll push it right along. And what happened was uh, I went to the manufacturing plant, Toyota, where that was. Uh, and the man who was running Toyota at the time said to me, oh, I think back in the 30s, uh, General Motors tried to uh, build some houses with rammed earth. And I said, oh, OK, can I have a look if there's any materials? Some materials was found. And lo and behold, I have for you, and if you don't mind, I'll just read this short letter that I found in this filing cabinet. And it says, to Professor Ralph Patty, South Dakota uh, Agricultural Experimenter Station, USA. Dear Sir, forgive me if I have taken your name in vain, but the endorsements will show it is in the cause of humanity. You are at liberty to use any conclusions I have drawn. I hope shortly to send you a drawing of a light type of frame that I have just successfully used. Yours, uh, fortunately, Alex Crosby. And I thought to myself, who is this Ralph Patty? And where in the hell is Brookings, South Dakota? <laughs> So, I was curious though, so I go home and I say to my wife, I got to go to Brookings, South Dakota. And she said, where in the hell's Brookings, South Dakota? <laughs> I say, well, I don't know where it is, but I got to go there. So, I wrote this letter. I have no idea, but I did have this word here. It said, uh, Agricultural Experimental Station. So, I wrote to the head of the uh, agricultural engineering section, uh, experimental station, and lo and behold, I get a letter back from the head of that school, uh, Ray Moore. And he said, yes, please, come to Brookings. So I arrived in Brookings. Uh, Ray picked me up, put me in the... Uh, center there, which is no longer here. Uh, and he said to me, if you want to go anywhere, just pick up the phone. The police will come and take you. I rang up. I said, I want a pizza. They took me. I said, I want to get a beer. They took me. Probably to Ray's Corner. I'm not quite sure, but you know, <laughs> somewhere out there. <laughs> um, which is not a bad place because you get to meet a lot of people. Anyway, uh, while I was here, uh, Ray took me, and we still haven't quite narrowed it down yet, but, but, but Ray took me to this building and said, well, this used to be the old milking parlor, and down here is where we stored the milk, and uh, there was all these filing cabinets. And he said, I don't know, but uh, you can look through there. So I started looking through there, and I want to say to you that I found this letter which is pretty amazing, I think. It says, Dear Mr. Crosby, you remember he had sent the letter here. We received your, your attractive bulletin and textbook on the construction of rammed earth and are very pleased to get it. It is gratifying to note that your people are making progress in the use of this material and the pictures prove that the buildings are large and substantial. Just how in your country we are faced with a new high labor cost, therefore building with rammed earth is not, uh, not too popular. This, I understand, is not one of your problems, and so you should progress without too high a construction cost. 
as far as we are concerned here in the agricultural engineering department you are quite welcome to repent and quote the results of Mr. Patty's work. It would be quite impossible for us to render the services in the way of bulletins for your country that your bulletin can give. In fact, yours is much more meaningful now in that you have shown work completed by your own people in their home communities. I think there will be no criticism on the part of any of our colleagues here. You, you have been very considerate in giving the South Dakota Experimental Station and Mr. Pratt, Patty credit where credit is due. You have also tried the planting method, but it's not proven very valuable for us. But perhaps your techniques are superior to ours in that respect. Also, we have a more severe freezing and thawing conditions, which in my opinion may cause such a procurement to fail here and to be successful for you. Best wishes to you and your work, and thank you again very much for the booklet. Yours very truly, H.H. H. DeLong, Head Department, Engineering. So, I find that in South Africa. I find this in the filing cabinet here. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I found, which I do not have with me, but this is just the cover page. And you see, you can see that, that uh, Professor Crosby and Professor R. L. Patty name on the full cover of this booklet. Now I want to say to you that Ralph Patty was a man at least 70 years ahead of his time. He could have, with all the research that he completed, he could have been lecturing in the 90s and the students would have been saying, what is he on about? It would have been very, very difficult to follow what he was saying. I don't know the man, but reading some of his notes from 24 years ago, I can tell you that he was obsessed. He says, it's the 24th of April, 1932. It is X degrees outside. I have this particular soil. It is 3% moisture. It has X amount of stabilizer. And we are starting to ram in compaction of two or three or four inch levels. Oh, it's now two o'clock and it's raining. We're ceasing ramming for the day. So every one of his walls were like his children, as they are to me. So you can imagine the excitement that I had thinking that I was gonna arrive in Brookings, South Dakota and find this huge, huge uh, yard of walls. I was obviously a little disappointed because someone had decided that they should come down. What was though, that we had the walls from the dean's residence and, and the president's residence, and we had the rammed earth building. And it was such that uh, I'm sure a lot of you knew Ray quite well, and he was a fantastic man. Um, he invited me to his house on that first night and asked me if I'd like a small drink. And I said, yeah, sure. And so he had his mate with him, and I don't remember his name, who was the head of South Dakota schools. And so they had these big glasses, as you do, I guess, here in America. And he pulled out the wild turkey and says to me, you like wild turkey? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so he, he tops this glass up like so. They drink theirs, I, okay. And then we have another and another. And I'm thinking, I don't know for sure if I can get up. <laughs> and then he tells me, oh, you're the guest speaker tonight at the Historical Society. <laughs> okay, okay, you, you wheel me there, I'll talk. So it was a great experience, and I realized that at that time, 
the people in the, in the local chapter here uh, were very keen on those walls, very keen to preserve those walls, as I was. And I'm still on the other side of the world. But I want to tell you that in my lectures and in my PhD thesis and those students who have followed me and looked to me for guidance, all of my work was based on Ralph Hattie and Henry Geelong. And I promote those two men every day of my life, mostly every day, to students, to colleagues, to people all over the world. And if you look closely, you will see that Ralph Patty is quoted in the United Nations and other places in publications. And back in my day, when I was doing my PhD, we didn't have Google. And so everything was done in stacks in the library, as a lot of you would know. It was very difficult. And finding something like what I found was just incredible. Now, sorry, I'll get carried away. I need to move on. Whoop, wrong one. Okay. Um, all right, so Ralph Patty. I, uh, thanks to uh, Carrie here. She gave me some information. This is Ralph Patty, uh, just very basic. Uh, some of you would probably know, but obviously he was a full professor here. He was head of department. He did research for 19 years, and I don't think the man ever stopped. And I don't know how he did other things in this research, but I did notice uh, when I was reading a note about building the rammed earth building, he was using students, as we all do, so he was smart that way. And uh, I'm not sure at this point when, when he passed. But this is, this is uh, Ralph's yard. I just photocopied this from a, from a print. But you can see here that, uh, do we have a pointer or not? That's oh, okay, it doesn't matter. But here you can see those little lines. Each one of those represents one of Ralph's walls that he built. Now they were uh, one, uh, sorry, I keep wanting to speak metric. They were one yard long. They were th uh, 32 inches high. They were 12 inches thick and they had a concrete slab on the top and they sat on a concrete base. Now what he did is he, he had gathered soils from around uh, South Dakota and he had, he had built these walls. He stabilized them with different types of, of material, so maybe he used some cement, he used some lime. Well basically those were the two. He put a damp course on the concrete so water couldn't rise and the caps he put on top overhung by two inches so that water just couldn't, it did, but it couldn't just run down the face of the walls. I'm not sure when they were taken down, I'm guessing probably in the 50s or maybe 60s, I'm not sure. But they were there quite a while. So what he did is he built 29, 26, 29 walls, sorry, I can't remember. And what he did then is he then built another series of walls using the same soil, except he adjusted the soil. So you can see each one of those represents a wall. There's quite a bit of work there. When I first came here, I thought that's what I was going to see. Now, you can see this. Again, I've taken this from photocopy. But you can sort of see his walls there. Now, in those days, uh, in Ralph's days, I think his goal as as being agricultural engineer, his job was to support farmers. There's no doubt. Farming was everything to him. And he wanted to be able to supply uh, farmers with information that they could build buildings that were less expensive. I don't like using the word cheap, but they were cheap. Okay? And all it required was labor, and he said, well, you have labor, and if you're prepared to do this, I've done these experiments and there you go. Because of that, he also realized that we needed to protect the surface from the snow, the rain, the freeze thaw, et cetera, et cetera. And what he did was, because that was the day and that was the time, and let me say there are still people who think like this today, in that we will put 
stucco on the outside of the walls. Those of you who know the two walls, you know the rammed earth building, you realize that it is covered in stucco. We do not do that anymore because of modern technology, because of, of science. Uh, they are able to supply us with a matrix that we can spray onto the walls that will penetrate the wall about one inch or one and a half inches. It then locks itself together in a matrix and it will repel water. So you can put a hose on it, water will just roll off it. But what it does do is it allows the wall to breathe, which is very important. Now those of us who know about building a concrete wall, we know that when we pull that concrete, and whether we vibrate it or not, we're pulling a concrete wall and we're vibrating it, we leave little tiny bubbles of water in there. They're very small. And then the winter comes and they freeze, and the spring summer comes and they thaw, and they freeze and they thaw, and the next thing you know we get some spalling on the face and it starts to slough off a bit. We've all seen that. That's a part of freeze thaw. Why would that not happen on our rammed earth wall, you say? Well, it will if you don't treat it properly. And like everybody, we're only compacting this material, moisture content on this material, would be somewhere around five or six or maybe eight percent. I've got a slide to show this example to you a little bit later. So, because we have very small moisture going into this compaction, we have very small amount of, of water to come out of the wall, but by spraying the wall and allowing the wall to breathe, it will push that extra moisture out, and so therefore uh, we should not have this. Now, uh, I must say this at this point, um, I, I've been down south um, and had a conversation and at this point the gentleman there has offered me five different types of solutions that I might be able to use. So our thought is to build five walls, spray each one of those walls with one of these solutions and we push them outside during the winter and next summer we'll have a look at them to see if any of those sealants were successful and to evaluate the walls. Now here you have uh, another story. Um, I'm a man of stories, sorry. Here was a man by the name of George Middleton. He was a palmy, uh, uh, sorry, an English fella. He was a he engineer architect in that era because in the old good old days you know, architects were engineers, and you did both, right? You, you knew something about engineering. And George came to Australia during the Second World War, served with the Royal Australian Engineers during the Second World War. And when the Second World War ended, there was a huge lack of building materials. Therefore, George decided to look at Earth. And when I was called by the CSIRO, our, our scientific research laboratories, to say, we have all these walls built by George Middleton, but hey, this is a really valuable site, and we're going to make a lot of dollars. You know, money's more important than this, so we're going to doze all these things down. Do you have any use for these walls? So I go to Sydney. It's right in Sydney. You can imagine. Five million people in Sydney, five million people in Melbourne. Half our population lives in those two cities. I mean, it cost a million dollars to buy a home in Sydney. I don't know how you afford that. But anyway, um, you can appreciate this land was super valuable. So I get there, and I find in George's archives a layout of his test walls. You know, thinking back to Rouse, you realize not as many walls, but it looks exactly. And when we look at the walls, you will see they look exactly like Ralph Patty's. 
because George communicated with Ralph Patty years before. And I found notes in George's files, he and Ralph and Hindry uh, communicating. Amazing. So, these are the walls that George built, and these are the walls that I thought I was going to see when, see when I first came to Brookings, South Dakota. Now you can see some of those walls, he's, he's had some formers, put some soil in, tamped it, put them in like blocks. Some of them he's just rammed the things. But look, he's on a concrete footing. He's got a concrete lip. He's one meter by one meter by 300. So he's one foot by three feet by three feet with a concrete cap on the top, exactly like Rouse. Why reinvent the wheel? And he didn't. So they were building a new building here, selling this off as units, and they called me. Each one of these little plaques represents when it was built, what it was built of, and so forth. And so I received a, a $5,000 grant, which was a lot of money in those days. Uh, I hired a truck, and I got a tungsten tip blade for my chainsaw, and I went at it, and I sectioned each one of these walls. There we are knocking the caps off. And here we are starting to cut the walls, cutting the walls so that we can take two sections of walls back to Canberra on that truck with me to the laboratory for testing. Being in Canberra, I guess like uh, similar to Washington, D.C., I mean, we have some pretty fancy equipment. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art uh, uh, testing laboratory. Uh, and what's even more important for me is that I had this state-of-the-art testing laboratory technician who knew everything about the machinery. And all I had to do was section it up and do whatever. And he did all the testing for me. So there we go. So that's, that's the walls. Just a few pictures. I'll keep going. Uh, I don't know if we can read this very well, but this is one of the plaques here. See, so it's... It was built on the 21st of the 10th, so the 21st of October, 1947. Ramming time, three hours. Uh, the damp course was a paint-on bitumous type material. Um, and he had 64% uh, sand and 36% clay. Now what George didn't do, and Ralph told him, but he didn't listen, is that Ralph told him, wait a minute, I've discovered that we need to look at colloids. So, so what is a colloid? A colloid is between 1 and 1,000 nano. So it is so, yeah, it's, so you've got to have an electron mi microscope to see it. But the problem is it never settles. It floats forever. And when, if it takes any water, those things will cause huge cracks. So those of you who have driven out through wherever and looked out your window and seen a big field with huge cracks and then it rains and you come back and there's no cracks, you know, there is a huge problem. And those are, those are problems for us with anything, but especially with rammed earth. So you can see there he went with 36% clay. He should have looked further into what is this. These are just uh, the sections of walls at the laboratory back in Canberra. And there you go. So that's me testing. 47 years these walls sit outside. And what's really interesting about that is that some smart spark in France uh, developed this test. It says, okay, how do you test an earth wall to see if it's if it's uh, structural. So he said, oh, look, uh, I've invented this test uh, that you get a shower head, small round shower head, and you put it X. So you take your block and you put it against this, this piece of steel and it's got a hole in the middle out of this steel. And you put this shower head that sprays towards that hole 
and you, and you put that at, at uh, 50 kPa of pressure or whatever it is, and you turn the water on for an hour. In 15 minutes, you stop and you stick a rod to see how deep the penetration is. And if it goes beyond 25 mil, the thing fails. Every one of George's walls failed that test. Now, how could they sit outside for 47 years and fail that test? Okay, we don't get snow in Sydney, for sure. But we get pretty cold. We might get down to 32. Certainly, we'll hit a 120 or so, or maybe more in the summer. And we get rain. Believe me, we get rain. So we get, you know, one, one and a half meters of rain a year in huge rainstorms. So we might get one foot of rain in three or four hours. And anyone knows that that's like pouring out of a bucket. And his walls sit there for 47 years. These are a summary. What's interesting is that when uh, Ralph Patty uh, investigated his walls, and he and Henry and someone else, whom I don't know, the three of them looked at those walls that he built in this big yard that we've seen, and they all visually inspected them and gave them a rating. <laughs> then I discover in here, in 1947, uh, George actually evaluated his walls in the same manner, and if you look in 1994, whatever it was, I evaluated his walls as well before we took them down in the same manner. Now, carrying this story on, I, one of the places I lived in Africa was Kamazi, Ghana. One of the safest countries in Africa, Ghana, love it. People were very nice. I was at the uh, scientific laboratories, and what did I see? But another yard based on Patty's examples. And this is one of the rammed earth walls, and I took this picture, and you can see it built in 1990, so forth and so on. Uh, it's a bit rough out there, you know, there's grass growing around and everything, but you see there, you know, I mean, Ghana, there's no money in Ghana. There's no money to do research, uh, but they do the best they can. Here's his walls. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Same, same type of layout, same type of walling system, same size of walls, everything the same. Amazing. So Ralph Patty, yeah, what a man. So today, we're looking at how am I testing? Okay, so we go to the field. So I come to your farm, or we go out in the country somewhere, and we're looking around at colors. Obviously, colors indicate to us what type of soils we may or may not use. So we dig a hole, and you see all the fellows there working so hard, watching us work, digging the hole. And then uh, you can see there, you know, I've got this material in my hands. Now look how that material's stuck to my fingers like that. So I've put a little bit of water on there. I got a little atomizer bottle, so I sprayed some soil in there. Rubbed it on my hands, rubbed it back and forth. And when you see like that, if I stuck my hand in a bucket of water, as you'd know, when I pulled it out, it would still be on there. So discount that straight away. It's too heavy in clay content. And here we are, just like this past week, uh, when I'm showing the director here, Gwen, and one of her people, Jess, how we might look to see how much moisture content there is in, in material. Uh, we use an electronic scale like you bake with, a microwave oven, and Bob's your uncle, as we say in Australia. Now here we are back in the laboratory, so here I am. Uh, actually, these are pictures of me testing uh, George Middleton's walls. And so I'm grinding, and I'm sieving, and I'm washing out, and I'm finding out exactly is the makeup of these walls as George described them. And had those walls been here of Ralph Patty's, and had they been told me that they were going to be dozed no matter what, I would have done the same thing here 
on those as well as well. So we, we put this material together. We put it into cylinders just like you would concrete. We put it in a bath of water for seven days, 10 days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, and we compressive test it. Okay, so we've gathered the, the material in the field. We've done some basic field testing. We've gone to the laboratory. We've washed the soils. We've done all those things. We've put it in the cylinders. We've left them in a, in a, in a bath of water. We've taken them out and we compressive tested them and said, yeah, okay, this one works, that one works, that one works. No, that doesn't work, and so forth. Then, after we've done that, oh, we'll get there in a minute. Here's, here's an example of, of colloids. The picture here you can see, number one, you can see just that little bit of line there representing colloids, right? That's how many colloids are in this soil sample. Now, colloids will expand themselves or absorb 900 times themselves. And so when that soil gets wet, there it is over there on slide number three. Pretty phenomenal. And when it dries out, it goes back to slide one. You can imagine if we put that into an earth wall, we got big problems. Here is an example of, uh, I'm sorry to bore you with this scientific stuff, but I'm, I'm moving on. Here is an example of one of the tests we do, which is optimum moisture. So we test the soils, we, de we determine what is the, just the perfect percentage of moisture to be in that soil, and when we compact it, when we compact it, we get the maximum density, the most weight we can get. And you can see up there, here's your moisture contents at the bottom. So you can see there, you know, there's about 7%, and you can see, uh, sorry, those in, in kgs, and I was going to convert those, but I forgot. So, I don't know, that's 2,180 kgs at maximum optimum moisture, about 7%. When you start to move out or backwards, you can see it drops off both ways. And so your walls aren't as dense, your walls aren't as strong, your walls will not carry the load. So this is, this is very critical. So once we've uh, done all this initial testing at the laboratory, we go back to the field. So here I am back in the field, and, and the boys are, are sieving the soil. And you see we've got five-gallon buckets. And you can see how we've got a sieve there running, and we're, we're taking the material underneath and putting them in the buckets so that we can weigh it. And then we have the material, and we make them into blocks. And you can see here we have a, a ute load of blocks that we've now back in the laboratory. We number everything. We put caps on the top and bottom of plaster Paris. And then we soak them in the water, as we're doing here, for 7, 10, 21, and 28 days. Then we put them in the machine, and we compressive test them. And here's the results of those. Now, this is just soil. So, if we had a five-gallon bucket of soil, and I put, uh, do I have the stabilization on there? No. Okay, if I was to put one-third of a cup of cement in with that five-gallon bucket of this particular material, these are the outcomes that I get. So, um, again, sorry, I, I don't know what uh, feet per square inch or pounds per square inch or whatever. <coughs> But I can tell you that six megapascals is a pretty strong wall. Because if we translate that into building a home or a small shed, a 2.7 high, um, a 10 foot wall, high wall, only requires 0.7 of a megapascal. These are six. And you can see we added another 10 day soaking and the results we're getting. So it's pretty severe, you know, we put these things in water and soak them, just leave them there. We take them out, we let them, put them on a piece of Hesham, burlap, whatever you call it, let them dry for one hour, put them in the we cap them, put them in the machine, and we crush them. 
and we get these results. Okay, so um, I gotta move along. There are three different types, you know this one very well. This is Adobe, we call it mud brick. Uh, I run a huge uh, project uh, initially in South Africa. It was meant to be rammed earth, but uh, every morning I came back, my rammed earth shutters were somebody's roof or walls, and it just didn't work. So I had to adopt uh, to a mud brickyard. So I'm gonna talk about Adobe's because you know all about this. These are a set of rammed earth walls. They were built for a church. And I'll show you the church later on. So that's basically these rammed earth walls. And these are compressed earth blocks. There are lots of manufacturers in America of compressed earth block machines. And you can see there, they, they have a male-female joint where they're connected together. You have the ability to lay some mortar in there. You have the ability to put your conduit in there if you want. Uh, they're about the same as rammed earth. They're a pretty good product, but they look like that. And look, looking at the wall, you, people wouldn't know they weren't bricks, fired bricks. Okay, let's look at some rammed earth. Here I am with uh, some students in Natal, and here's a very simple timber formwork. Not like what Ralph used, or what, like what Professor Crosby used, no. Um, this is a different kind of formwork, just very simple, made with ply. You can see, and we're, and we're making a set right now here uh, at the museum, and we hope to ram a wall before I leave here at the end of this week. And uh, I won't carry on with that. Just a little close-up. Now, you notice that uh, the threaded rod we have through there, I have some little uh, timber wedges there on the end. And the reason they're there is that the compaction is so tight on this material uh, that if we didn't have the timber wedges, we wouldn't be able to get those bolts out. So that we knock the wedges out, and we can take the bolt out. And you also notice that we have a piece of, a uh, bit of thin steel pipe over the top of the threaded rod. So again, it just slides out for us. Uh, this is more like, uh, I just hooked this slide from another presentation. This, this is uh, more like the type of formwork, a little advanced as to what Ralph and, and, and Crosby would have used, and other people, and the French, and this is in the 1600s and so forth and so on. They would have used this. So I adopted this um, in South Africa for this particular project. And there you go, we can see the woman. Now the thing about it is, um, all built with women, everything. They're not super strong. Uh, and it, I think they, they do a really good job. It's not going to fall down. The great thing about it is it's bulletproof for them. Uh, I mean literally bulletproof. So that's really good. And you can see how we just sort of formed it up, knocked out for the windows and so forth and so on. Okay, let's get into... Here we are. Uh, this is about... Uh, 1980 in Canberra, where I live. And here we are, the surveyor's been on site. He's laid out the survey pegs for us. We're measuring over there and we're erecting this formwork. Now, what you'll see in the next slide is that I learned, why would I dig into the ground and put a footing there if I've got solid ground, one meter or half a meter or whatever it might be? If it's two or three meters, yes. But why would I do that? So what I do is I use a thing called a penetrometer, which is a long rod with a point on it with a big weight. You drop it, you drop it, you drop it X times. You then measure the depth that went into the ground, and that tells you where solid ground is. I then say to the dozer operator, take the top soil off of this, push it over there, take me down to 800, take me down to 3 feet, take me down to 2 feet, take me down to 4 feet. Then I come and put my formwork right on top of the ground. And so they're measuring off of the survey pegs to where we're going to pour the footings so that the house is exactly right. We then shot a level, a dumpy level, inside the formwork, stripped out the formwork, and there you go. There's the footings ready for us to ram walls. The floors go in almost last. So we do the footings, 
we do the walls, we do the roof, and then we say to the client, what would you like in this room? Now, most of us would pour a concrete slab. And the first thing we do is we say, okay, well, carpet, tiles, timber, I don't know, some type of floating floor, whatever it might be. All money. Some of us might polish the concrete. Okay. Anyway, I say, well, why sh maybe you want something different. Maybe you want earth floors, because I've done several hundred homes with earth floors. Maybe you want uh, brick pavers. I've done several houses with nothing but brick pavers inside. Looks pretty nice. Um, so I give the client then the option. And they say, no, I want some tiles and concrete in the kitchen. Okay, just back the concrete truck up there through the windows because there's no windows yet. And we pump it, float it, and away you go. So here we are on site, this particular material. We're mixing it with lime, 4% uh, lime. And there I am mixing it with my tractor and rotary hoe. Here are the fellas aligned to formwork. As you can see, it looks just like ordinary concrete formwork, which it is. And, but there's so much pressure on this stuff. You can see there that, that we're using these steel whalers. So they're 100 plus, uh, they're 4 plus inches. And they hook onto the formwork. They keep it straight. And they keep it horizontal and vertical as we tie it off. Here's a close-up. Now, a, a lot of the stuff I developed myself out of necessity. So you can see that little round thing, and it hooks on, onto your acro prop, which you can buy acro props anywhere here. Well, that we use goes over the piece of steel that you can see there, and that we use that to straighten the formwork. We keep it. So when we finish the walls, we are plus or minus one millimeter. I don't know what that is, but, you know, I don't know. Is that a 64th or something like that? Anyway, so there we go. We're dead level at the top. We ran right to the top of the formwork, and we're dead level because we leveled our footings day one with a dumpy level, as we remember. So here we are. You can see there we're putting the acros in place. Um, we're standing on those whalers. And what we used to do is I used to build one, two, three levels, take one off, leapfrog it, build that, take another one off, and get to the top, which I can show you a presentation, some stuff in Africa, which I didn't put here. Um, and that's, that's the way we build it. Unfortunately, one time I was up about uh, 18 feet in the air, and we had these three formers on top, and we had these steel rods in the bottom, and all of a sudden, one of those things blew. And the, whole, the wall didn't fall over, but the bottom of the wall went like this. There was so much pressure, we exerting all this pressure. So, from that day on, I never leapfrog any things. We stacked it all the way to the top. You'll notice the, the corner brace there that we, that we made and developed. I gotta keep moving here. Uh, there I got my apprentice inside. That was his job. Three years he was with me and then he said one day, oh, Dr. Steve, he said, I've had enough. I wanna go do stick building. I want an easy life. So off he goes. He's putting some keys and wedges in there. And there we are, just a quick shot of um, us using pneumatic rammers. Now, uh, we don't do it by hand, pneumatic rammers. What I have learned over the years, we can, uh, there are a lot of smart uh, mathematicians and, and physicists about. And so we can look at the stroke of the rammer, how far it comes out. We can look at the weight of the rammer. We can look at the size of the pad. We can look at the depth of the material I'm putting in there. And I can tell you exactly how to compact the material, how many times to run the rammer over it, because you can't over compact it. I can tell you how many times to run the rammer over it, and what our density is going to be when we finish. And if you don't believe it, we can call the laboratories and they'll come and test it and, and tell us. And here we are, shoveling some material into the formwork and ramming it. 
Now, one little thing I'll point out uh, is that you may have seen on that other slide a little blue hose. Anybody who knows anything about pneumatic grammars knows that when you hook onto a 100, 150C FM compressor, you know, one of those big guys like what we had, the hose is about that big around. And you put that thing over your shoulder, you don't last very long. So that was another experiment that took me about three years to figure out. But I realized that I could reduce to an ordinary half-inch hose if I had an air filtration system because even if it's 100 degrees outside, your rammers will freeze up with the moisture condensation inside the air. So we have to filter that. So anyway, that's, and it was a lot easier for everybody. Uh, not so much me, uh, but for everybody else, just having a little blue hose over the shoulder. Again, there we are. We're shoveling, looking. And here we are at the very top, and we're compacting. You notice it's all very work safe. We have scaffold everywhere, so you can step straight off of this thing, straight onto the scaffold. Uh, you have to have a scaffold, scaffolder's uh, certificate. It takes two years at TAFE to get licensed. Um, scaffolding is a very, for those of you who deal in that area, you know that it's, it's, it's quite a precise uh, thing that needs to be done, that needs to be done correctly. Uh, there are plenty of uh, cowboys that think they know about it, and people die, and it's, it's not right. Here we have a, a little thing at the top, and one day we realized that at the very top, we're putting so much pressure on that last little bit to get that thing level that the, the top of the formwork wanted to spread apart, even though we had these steel whalers on it. And so one of the bikes that worked for me, I said, uh, okay, we need to develop some kind of a tool to hold those things together. So he did. He went away and just got some ordinary, as you can see, some ordinary pipe clamps, and we made some brackets to fit underneath uh, the formwork and we screwed on there, and that was fine. Now, his name was Jed, so we called these Jeds. Uh, the guy that invented the other thing for the, uh, for the acros is, we called him Rabbit, so those things became rabbits, so we always do all the tools. Here we are, here I am, stripping out a wall. That's the wall as it is. So we ram it, and as soon as it's done, we strip it out straight away. It's ready to go. We can stack it, but first thing we do is we seal it. Uh, this is just another shot of us stripping out some formwork on site. And here we are, that's me and another fella. Uh, we're just spraying the walls with an airless spray gun. Um, and this is the material I was talking to you about earlier that penetrates the wall. This is uh, not a real good shot, but this is a particular finished set of walls that we built. Um, here we, I use a lot of recycled timber, so I just bolted those, uh, those are, I don't know how to explain ratings on timber, but these, these are hardwood beams that are actually uh, about 150 years old, and they were recycled out of a bridge, and I just dressed them up, um, I could talk a whole lecture on that, and uh, bolted them together, put them over the top of the earth walls, and then we ran straight on top of them. They became our lintels instead of concrete. Okay, uh, let's look at an international project. Here we go. Here we are in uh, Asia. Um, I love bamboo. Um, it's it's a, a noxious weed for us in Australia, so you're not allowed to grow it. Uh, we import ridiculous. We report bamboo if you want to buy some bamboo from China. Uh, down to the garden center, and you go down and pay for it. So here we are. So I wanted to incorporate the rammed earth with the bamboo because this technology, uh, bamboo, um, the Brazilians are fantastic with bamboo. There has been umpteen PhD students working on bamboo research, and the whole thing with bamboo is how do you connect it together? And if you try to use modern technologies, you know, screw guns, screws, uh, et cetera, it, it just doesn't work. So you need to put it together correctly. Obviously, in Asia, these people, 
male and female, can tie this stuff like there's no tomorrow. And we didn't need any screws or nails, as you can sort of see there. Here we are, moving, progressing the walls with the roof structure, strictly bamboo. And we're going to put uh, a woven matting on the top. Here we made some little, uh, because of monks and those type of things, they like to meditate, we made some little uh, indentation, sort of uh, recessed uh, meditation spots for monks and other people who just want to think about today and yesterday and an hour from now. And we tried to mix up the materials a little bit to give it that sort of different feel uh, to create some type of ambience that was special to particular people. So, you know, we, if we were building a rammed earth building here, we'd want to incorporate uh, different cultures, uh, different areas of Dakota in our building to, sh to show what we could do. This is the roof structure. You can see there we're, we're laying the thatch over the top. Uh, okay, let's go on to some Australian projects. Okay, so here's those set of walls, those rammed earth walls I showed you. This is the church that it came from. So you can see, I mean, we're not dummies. Okay, let's get concrete, you know, let's form beams, and then let's just set them on our rammed earth walls and ram over the top of them, set them off. Put a nice, look at the edge of the concrete and the earth. You know, we use a, a, a half inch piece of uh, triangular type material that we, we pull around there to give it a nice edge because everyone, everyone wants to prove to you that it'll fall apart so they, everybody wants to uh, you know, break the corners off for you. This is just another shot of the altar of the Ramder Church. This is a, a four-story hotel uh, in Brisbane. Uh, which is on the east coast, up above Sydney, about, a, about a, I don't know, 800, 900 miles from Sydney, north, four stories, rammed earth. Was built, uh, I don't know, built 1990, 88, something like that. This is a Jewish school in Sydney itself, a beautiful school. Um, these walls are, I don't know, 20, 25 feet or more. And then behind there, you can see how we've bridged out of there and have walkways for the students between the walls. This is just a shot of a, uh, you know, a regular dining room. That's a rammed earth wall in the background. It looks a lot like marble, I guess. You know, that kind of texture. Not, most people wouldn't know it, that it wasn't. If you said to them it's earth, they probably wouldn't believe you. Um, here we have some rounded walls. Uh, it's, a, it's a nature center. Um, the, actually, the walls curve, and then they curve back, and, and they go up as well. So we can do just about anything with earth. Here we have uh, uh, earth floors, earth walls, rammed earth walls, and straw ceilings. I mean, look at the floors. I think the floors look pretty nice. I've had women come through exhibitions in stilettos, people come through and they say, wow, this floor, is this cork? No, it's not cork. Feels like it got a little bit of give to it. But stilettos don't tear it up. And uh, yeah, so that's finished. Now, I didn't do anything to that. Uh, so let's think about it. You know, we have a concrete slab, so we have concrete that we pay for, whatever. We have steel we pay for, and we pay for the manpower to put it down. Okay, so if we look at earth floors, we got no steel, no concrete. We use the same material that we use for the walls. We still have a membrane, and we still have to pay the labor to put it down. But it is definitely less expensive. Here's another uh, sort of Molly story. Rammed earth walls, earth floors, straw ceilings. You probably know better than I that compacted straw, besides be setting aside the R rating, which is super high, it is, it is so tightly compacted. I'm sure there are companies here in America that produce it, as there are in Australia. This wheat stole. Um, we actually built one of these at the University of South 
Australia, where I'm associated as well. And we got the fire brigade, and we actually set it alight. And we couldn't get it to burn. So we took 44-gallon uh, uh, drums of diesel inside, set those alight. We used gas on it. We got it burning, but we couldn't keep it burning. Pretty amazing stuff. Uh, this is just one of my finished homes. That was the one we were just looking inside of, actually. Now we get to uh, the, probably the newer side of town. This is a five-story rammed earth hotel south of Melbourne. Um, yeah, I mean, it speaks for itself, the way it looks. Uh, here it is from a distance. Um, people think, oh, that earth thing, it'll fall over. Well, not really. This inside a church. Uh, now there we wanted the effect of the, the layers look like they're kind of slumped. So we put those in very small layers, about 50 mil, and they kind of rounded a bit to give that effect to go with the shape of the church and the roof structure itself. And that's it. Thank you.